post it later. There we go. So welcome, Otto. Welcome, everybody. People who are new, people who are still joining us, like Olivia there. Let me, uh, I thought there was a way to shut off the sound here. Hey, Olivia. There we go. Now you won't hear the beeps coming over every time somebody comes in and joins or leaves. So we have a we have an exciting piece this week, a big one, and a tough one, a late one that that um, that really goes back and and uh, it's kind of a, a retrospective, um, hitting themes that are developed in much greater detail in all sorts of other essays that are sketched out here, but in a way that's sort of systematic, both talking about Heidegger and Heidegger's beginnings. It clearly was written in the wake of the publication of these these 1920-21 Marburg lectures that came out one one year earlier, where Gadamer says, if you really want to understand the appeal of Heidegger, you got to look at Heidegger's beginnings. And then talking about Heidegger's returning to a, the Greeks as foreshadowing the, the radical thinking that went on. And I think his audience, he probably thinks his audience has especially in mind the critique of technology and the age of the world picture, given what he's saying about, about the way that Greek thinking takes on the uh, scientific thinking and then he turns in the end to tell us what we really should think about Plato as opposed to what Heidegger thought about Plato right Heidegger sort of dismissed Plato as just being on the way to Aristotle and then Gadamer gives us his own views at the end so that's kind of exciting so there's plenty to try to work through here to try to get clear on and and to learn from so as usual I will open it up if there's something someone really wanted to open with, couldn't imagine not starting with this because it was such an important part of the reading. I'll take volunteers. It helps to raise your hand. Oh, Jim. Yeah, sorry. I went looking for you because I know you don't do the hand signal. <laughs> you do it. The old so I should do the hand signal. Is that what you're telling me? It's easier, but I can scroll through. See, I'm so used to teaching for all these years when, anyway. Yeah. Well, I had asked the group to consider this essay because I think it's truly remarkable. The essay is really, I would say, not about Heidegger. It's all about Gadamer. Um, and I think it's more nuanced here. And it's a more holistic picture than what you find elsewhere. So what we know generally is well known is that Gadamer critiques Heidegger about two things. There's no language of metaphysics and there's, he's got Plato wrong. But of course, Gadamer even said that later in life, Heidegger saw, uh, was more lenient towards his reading of Plato than he had been thanks to Gadamer's insistence. So I think this is a remarkable essay because it's more nuanced, even with respect to his critique of Heidegger than I've seen elsewhere uh, about the whole idea of motility and presence and, and presencing and phusis that Heidegger takes from Aristotle. But then Gadamer is not con content to let that go, even though uh, within his own hermeneutics, and that means his relation to Plato, because Gadamer too, wants to say that hermeneutics is all about a certain motility. So what I found most interesting then, it comes out, I think, quite clearly at the end, is how Gadamer is acknowledging or saying here what he means by hermeneutic finitude without tying that finitude to temporality and historicity and without tying finitude to simply the human finitude that we can't get at the truth. That is, it's a question of the finitude of being expressed through Plato that Gadamer takes on. And a last comment, all of this also nuances the complicated relationship of Gadamer's hermeneutics with his indebtedness, not just to Plato, but to the German Aristotelian, namely Hegel.
Okay, thanks Jim. That's quite a start. <laughs> yeah, Don. Uh, well, you know, that's a wonderful opening statement, and I think does help to orient us and get the uh, get the the force, the real significance of this essay. And I appreciate the outline that you sent as well, which I think was helpful in kind of helping to sort out what's going on here. But uh, beyond that, fools rush in. So <laughs> um, I I'd kind of like to look at some of uh, of uh, how Gadamer's interpretation of Plato constitutes a critique of Heidegger's interpretation of Plato. So especially in these uh, closing pages here, the sort of last of uh, the last pages from 262 on, where Gadamer says, I see it differently. Yeah. And then he goes on to say how he sees it differently. But I think it would be helpful if we can kind of dig into into that a little bit and see well where's where's the difference? What is what does Gadamer think is different from Heidegger? How is he uh, trying to set aside certain views of Heidegger? Uh, I mean, I can start that, but I'm happy to if other people want to pursue that. I'm I'm happy to hear what they may be able to say to illuminate me. <laughs> John, do you want to talk about the same thing, or did you want to bring something else up? Different, uh, but this this we should probably take on later. Uh, but it has to do with those closing pages again, which is the thing that struck me is that he started to talk a lot about the relationship between the universal and the particular, and uh, you know that's the theme that winds through truth and method. Um, so. He, he seemed to want to say more about that here. Uh, so I hope we definitely try to tackle that um, a little bit later. There is one thing, a, a small thing, which is that, you know, this one, one of the reasons this reading is difficult to me is because it feels very discursive and extemporaneous and fluid. Um, he, it, you, you're not always clear, you know, well, he does give you a through line, right? But you sort of wonder why he's moving from topic to topic, but then he sort of tells us in the middle what his method is. Um, he describes what he's trying, the way he's going about this. And so uh, in terms of the sort of the expository method, if we could talk about that. Where, where, did, where in the middle are you thinking of? Uh, yeah, it's on, uh, I'll tell you in, in the English, it's on page 250, uh, the before the last paragraph, um, he's describing what they did in the past, right? He, he's not saying that this is what he's doing now, but I think it's what he's doing, where he says, uh, we did not have the feeling of progressing from point to point, from argument to argument, but rather believed in the end to have circled around a single object and in such a way that this something finally stands before us, our eyes in its three dimensions. I, I guess that would be a hypothesis of mine. The account of phenomenology that he yeah. gives when he's talking about how exciting it was to study with Heidegger. Uh, do you feel like that that's the way he's working in this text as well? Well, I, to, 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 I mean, I guess by process of elimination because of, I mean, did other folks feel that way or not? That that it's um, there's a sort of a fluidity where he sort of, I mean, this is very common to him, right? But much more so later, right? Where, and maybe more in these talks, you know, where um, um, he, he moves very quickly from one topic to the next and you're not always certain. I mean, it, he doesn't, he doesn't, it's not like, as he says here, a standard argument where uh, you move in a linear way uh, in a logical expository way from one thing to the next with very clear transitions so that you really understand where you are in the structure of the argument. It's much more fluid than that. And so, for example, the whole issue of the relationship between the 
universal in the particular. I actually had to go back to truth and method um, and to, to, to sort of go to the key, uh, the cruces in the text to remind myself what he was saying about that relationship to fill in because um, here he's so sort of suggestive and elusive about it. At least I found it that way. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. John Beach. John, you may have to unmute yourself. Uh, no, I'd like to add uh, to what John says. It's, it's really important to see um, exactly what, what John is saying that, that, but this is Gadamer's uh, verbal uh, way of, do, of philosophizing. This is what he this is why he never did use a, a written text, even the one we studied in Ottawa. I disagree with Jean Cortin on that. And he did speak in English because anyway, we won't go into that. But, uh, but the, uh, he's, he, he's uh, talking about a lifetime of knowledge and he brings it all together. He's, he's, he's speaking without notes too, always. And uh, He's, uh, I mean, it helps if you know all the other things he's written about Greek philosophy over the years, Gadamer has to sort of, because they, they all get touched on, although here there's quite an emphasis on the, uh, on the sophist because he's, he's talking about, you know, in, in terms of Heidegger's way and Heidegger's, he's critiquing in a way Heidegger's concentration on being, and there's another way to, 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 to approach being than then, you know, through the being as the transcendent sort of thing in a way that, that Heidegger did. But uh, yeah, no, I know that, that, that I think that that's quite common to Gadamer is, is, is that his. And, and I just add too that um, while I'm talking now, I'll be quiet for a while, but that the um, um, Gadamer is very, brings out a lot of what Heidegger says uh, as Jim points out, it's really uh, expressing what Gadamer himself is thinking, but he interprets Heidegger in a very positive way. And I don't think there's any other person alive who, who's understood Heidegger better than Gadamer, especially with regard to the Greek stuff. And um, so I think that, that there's an interesting way that his critique is also uh, a strengthening of, of what Heidegger had to bring but also a, a distant, a very subtle, but di and distancing. <laughs> and I'll tell you one little anecdote. I was with Heidegger personally alone one day when he received the letter from Heidegger and he opened it in his office. And uh, it was, that was in 1975. And it was from Heidegger. And it turns out it was about Plato. And, um, when we when he pulled it out of the, his box in the office, we were walking up the stairs to his office. He wanted to talk to me about something. I started talking. He put puts his hand up like that, like don't speak. I thought, oh. <laughs> so we got in, sits down, reads his letter, and then he says, "Okay, this is from Heidegger," and I just sent him something uh, about Plato. And I think it was I think it was one of those three that 72, 73, 74, those they're in dialogue and dialectic and he says uh heidegger approves of what i've just written and he says now we can talk <laughs> okay i'm done <laughs> yeah that's great john thanks for that that story jim yes i was um, oh. um yes i'm agreeing with the two johns i think uh john arthos you use the language of uh, it feels an odd text, and yet you still use the word uh, disc, not well organized, and yet you use the word fluid. And I think John Beach's comment about how Gadamer writes an essay is quite accurate uh, about him not writing everything down. So the logic <clears throat> is always uh, qualified by the character of the living thought. But I think the fluidity is a good word because I do think in this essay, Gadamer connects the beginning with the end quite well. <clears throat> and my comment earlier about this is as much about Gadamer as about Heidegger, 
notice ostensibly the beginning, even the title, on the way back to the beginning. And he's talking about really, it's a, it's that's ambiguous. It's Heidegger's beginning, but it's also Gadamer's beginning. Now, what is that beginning? It's the beginning in phenomenology. In 23, when he hears Heidegger give the, the course on Aristotle, that this was new to me, he says half it was on uh, the rhetoric and the other half on ethics. But in that beginning, he sees how Heidegger is doing something that revolutionizes, but, well, that, that changes the whole character even of phenomenology because he carries out a destruction in a way that classical phenomenology does not. But you see in that beginning then that the common point is, as everyone knows now, is with the Greeks here and the way that Gadamer's own philosophical hermeneutics develops from Heidegger's own beginnings. Why I say it comes to an end, because at the end, he pulls, he draws in that notion that Grandin writes about this thing that Gadamer changes his position a little bit when he draws on the on Schelling. But that word that is in German, it's unfordenklich. And uh, it's the Paul and Arun translated as in memorial, I'm sure. Uh, that word, really the best, better translation for unfordentlich, it's impossible, it's Schelling's word, is unprethinkable. So the idea of this immemorial in memory, that is one never, there's something immemorial in memory. And that if you look at Gadamer's project, I think he's saying that from the beginning. There's something that memory can't, all, can't recover. And that's part of tracking the trace. That's part of the infinity of the conversation. Um, so he's coming back to a the philosophical question about the character of a beginning. Shows how Heidegger is developing, he's developing, and then he makes his own philosophical point about he doesn't say it this bluntly, how hermeneutics is always about this kind of a retrieval that you see, actually. He says, you can see it in a way that his hermeneutics aligns more with Plato then, than Aristotle. That's what I saw him saying at the very end of the essay. So I saw his, he really was, came, circled back to the beginning, but now it had all this, nuance of what he was saying in the whole essay. Maybe that's a good transition to take up Don's suggestion to focus on this last section, because it, the text is, is pretty clearly divided up. Um, and then it turns on 262, where he says, I wonder whether one must not see things differently in Plato, right? Where he finds the roots of um, Aletheia in Plato, and he's not as dismissive of Plato as, as Heidegger is. So maybe it's worth looking and seeing how the argument works there. I uh, put a copy of the sections of Plato's Sophist in the, in the chat there, if you want to see this very elaborate discussion about the nature of difference and the nature of non-being that he's referring to when he talks about this. Don, right, that was what you're asking for, is that we look closely at this section, these pages at the end, to see how uh, Gadamer, is, Gadamer is going back to the beginning to recover Plato against Heidegger? Yes, I I, uh, I had a, a sense of what was going on, but uh, getting people who know much more about it than I do to help me sort it out, would, I would appreciate uh, just to say, in large terms, uh, it seemed to me that this pivoted on, on a couple of ideas where he thought Heidegger was misinterpreting Plato or that there was a different way of seeing Plato. And one of these ways had to do with the Heideggerian idea that Plato is leading us toward the notion of the statement as correct statement, mm -hmm. being as subordinated, aletheia as being subordinated to 
correct statement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and the pivot of that discussion, uh, this, the second issue, I should say, is the nature of dialogue. Okay, that these two things, these two features of Plato are things that Heidegger did not fully appreciate. Okay, and so he seems to say that at the top of, of uh, 262, I think it is, yeah. Yep. Uh, where he's returned from a for several pages before to the discussion basically of, of uh, Plato's doctrine of truth. Of Heidegger's treatment of Plato and Plato's doctrine of truth, and right. that's what he's dissenting from. Okay, and the issue of the statement pivots, I think, on uh, his discussion of the sophist, indeed. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and especially of uh, the, the sophist treatment, which he talks about many times, of the pseudos. Uh, this example of the statement, "Theaetetus is flying." Right. You know, and why that's, are you saying something? Or are you not saying something? How do we understand the possibility of saying something like Theaetetus is flying? Okay. Uh, so uh, that issue, well, I don't want to go on and on about that. I could say more, but, uh, but I'm thinking that those are the, the two issues that he brings out. If he doesn't agree that Plato is directing the understanding of being toward correct statement and he doesn't believe that he's uh, and he believes that he is directing it toward dialogue that is that dialogue is essential to it uh, so i could say more but yeah. i would love to let other people talk i should say if you're not familiar with this there is part of the background here is that we have one of plato's letters called the seventh letter where Plato says he basically never wrote down what he really thinks, right? There was, and then, and Aristotle in a number of places talks about um, Plato's written teach, uh, oral teachings, which differ from his written teachings. And, and Aristotle basically says Plato was a Pythagorean and forms were identified with numbers. And this is not something you can find easily in, in the dialogues. You can sort of look through to find hints to it. So there's always been a question about whether the dialogues hold Plato's real views, or whether they're just devices he would use in the classes, or whether he would lead them, lead students sort of away from their mistaken views toward his actual view. And so part of what's going on here is trying to navigate those debates because it figures in also the relationship between Plato and Aristotle, trying to figure out what sort of development happened there, what views they share and don't share. And that's, that's part of what's going on here. I think I think many people know that, but maybe not everybody knows that's that's what's going on here. Um, the uh, the uh, okay, so the Aetetus flies, right? Oh, Mariella, want to get in here? Yes, uh, I just wanted to follow up on the uh, difference between uh, Gadamer and Heidegger regarding Plato, and also to continue. Uh, the idea launched by uh, Jim Risser at the beginning, uh, namely that here, Gadamer is offering uh, a notion of finitude that is not tied to temporality and historicity. So it seems to me that the um, novelty that Gadamer is bringing here is Plato's mathematics, which he, Gadamer, takes as a sort of uh, model of metaphysics, so uh, um, non-calculative, uh, non-essentialist metaphysics. Um, and uh, the um, reference he makes is on page 267, uh, in which basically he's saying that uh, we have on the one hand the, um, you know, this famous um, theory about uh, the diagonal uh, and the equation that uh, brings up the uh, uh, value of the diagonal. But then he um, is observing that uh, the doubling of the side resulted in something four times the area and the halving of the side again did not result in the right square. 
Thus, by squaring the diagonals, he comes to see the irrationality of the root of two, as we would say algebraically. So um, I, I did uh, check a little bit online. I was not familiar with uh, Gadamer's uh, speculations about mathematics, but uh, it seems that for Gadamer, the uh, platonic mathematics um, is a very compelling uh, model of the relationship between the one and the many. Uh, I found a very convincing article by John Gardner before we uh, had uh, this meeting. So that uh, on the one hand, uh, you have, um, let's say number five, that is a uh, composition of uh, five unities. So one plus one plus one plus one, whatever, or even a composition of two and three. Um, but on the other hand, the property of five cannot be fully retrieved in each unity. So the property of five cannot be retrieved in the property of one, even though one is, so to speak, a part of this whole, which is five. So it seems that here, the uh, one and many, the relationship between one and many is not fully um, transparent. And that's where the finitude is opening up because uh, we, um, uh, we are somehow stimulating to constantly investigate uh, this relationship, uh, which is not fully transparent. So that seems to me to be uh, somehow the um, alternative that Gadamer has, uh, has brought to um, Heidegger's uh, essentialist reading of uh, Plato. So the idea that uh, we don't have a pure um, univocal relationship between the essence of five and the numbers or the unities that compose five, so to speak. And that uh, the, uh, this is rather a relationship between the one and the many. And uh, this relationship in turn um, opens up again, uh, an idea of finitude, which is dialectical and is not explained here uh, in historical and practical terms, but rather in mathematical terms. So that's, you know, that's the, First impression I got, as I said, I'm not very familiar with Gadamer's um, mathematical speculations. I find it very fascinating. Yeah, thanks, Mariela. So there's an example that he gives. I looked back at the Plato unwritten, uh, unwritten teachings, whatever the the old essay is, um, that helped me. So can I can I throw that back to you and see if that's the same thing you're talking about or something else? He talks about beauty right, a classic Plato thing. And he says, it's not simply that every beautiful thing we see, we then recognize the form of beauty in it. It's like, oh, there's the form of beauty again, as if maybe we would just need one, and then we can abstract and understand the form of beauty. He says, each new beautiful thing is beautiful in its own unique way. So that the many is, he says, it's, it's summative. It's like mathematics, you're adding on to it. Um, it combines and expands and continues our idea of beauty so that with each new experience of beauty, we have, it's still beauty, but it's added something to our experience. And here he talks about like a mathematical sum in the way that maybe five plus one gives us six. And now we've added something, but it, that wasn't simply contained in the individual numbers up to that time. So that was, that's the model of one of the many I thought was helpful for me was the idea mm -hmm. that unity of beauty is summative rather than, rather than um, unitary across examples. Does that sound like the same thing you're talking about or am I talking about something else when I give that example? Right, it's summative, but at a certain, at the same time, it's not summative in the calculative mode, which of course, it, I mean, if, uh, a layman would hear us speaking about this would think, what do you mean that the sum is not calculation? But that seems to be here, uh, Gadamer's idea that uh, the meta, meta, meta mathematics that Plato is proposing is more than simply calculative thinking because 
um, uh, in a sense, there is a sort of intuitive um, uh, grasp of five at the end of uh, the sum of, uh, you know, two plus three or one plus one plus one plus one plus one and whatever. So that um, there is no pre, uh, and here perhaps also this uh, concept of unfordenklich uh, comes up. So there is no um, pre-established algorithm that uh, through this algorithm I get from two plus three to, to five, there is rather a sort of intuitive kind of uh, path that uh, we arrive at when we make the, um, you know, the sum between two plus three. So, and that, that was for me intriguing, the fact that Gadamer has um, uh, sought to fight the calculative kind of thinking of modern science uh, with Plato's mathematics. Uh, and again, the whole um, speculation he is making on the relationship between one and the many seems to uh, make an analogy between mathematics on the one hand and the living uh, experience of community because we are having this whole relationship between one and the many also in our um, uh, dialogue, in the social life, in the culture of life and so on. Okay, yeah, thanks. John Beach. I'm muted. John, I think you're muted. <laughs> yeah, and um, for Gautamer, the, the uh, arithmos is not a, a universal, and it's, uh, while it is a many, but it's composed of different parts. Like there are parts like odd, even different characteristics of numbers that are not included or are not sort of summed up or included in the idea of the, the sum number itself. I think that's important. And, and also the um, Gautama uses the, the, the one many uh, to, to, to try to avoid the, uh, uh, the, the, the Neoplatonist interpretation of Plato that's pretty dominant today. And um, because Gadamer uh, says that with Plato, there is never a one, there's never a universal. In fact, even uh, without the many, they're, they're never separated because that's the finitude part. And, and also the, um, the, the idos itself is not a universal. And this is Heidegger didn't grasp that. Nor, nor really did, did I mean, air, air universals pretty much begin with Aristotle. Nevertheless, as, as John also points out, he talks about the universal here because it's part of our understanding. It's part of our um, conceptual um, vocabulary. So that's all I was gonna add to that. Okay. That makes things, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, Jim Rizzer. Yes, to stay on this, these points. On that page 267, the bottom paragraph then says, it would better not to call, not to call Platonic dialectic metaphysics. This is part of Gadamer's radicality. So if Heidegger is carrying out this destruction of metaphysics, in a way, Gadamer is there too, but he can take it from Plato, not from Heidegger's own way of trying to free up the question as we see in the beginning of this paper, from temporality, the question of movement, that is the question also of temporality. So this is really remarkable, as if to say that Gadamer is regarding Plato not as this speculative philosopher, as we, as you know, the um, traditional classic textbook does, which also incidentally reads Plato from Aristotle as, as Heidegger was wont to do. So getting back to this issue of the mathematical. Yes, I, to you, David Vesey, I would not say the num uh, when you're looking at the beautiful, which is a different idea than other ideas, don't forget. Um, that's what the Phaedrus makes clear. Um, I don't, I think summative could be misleading as a word, even though the mathematical addition pertains to something summative. That is, like an inductive argument, if you add up the parts, your inductive conclusion as a generalization, 
you could say is summative, uh, especially when you see how Gadamer talks about experience, you're adding up the units that are all uh, self-affirming to the previous ones. That that's precisely what Gadamer is not talking about, as if that the mathematical does not lend itself to a logic of deduction or induction. And that means the whole language of universals in particular, that deduction hangs on, or even general in particular, that induction hangs head on. So what he's saying is that the mathematical complicates the relation between whole and parts. And Gadamer says that Plato can't fully account for that relation. That relation, he uses that word methexis, participation, but we know Plato does not explain methexis clearly. So I hope I'm making everything, trying to follow points here. So my way of, I think John Beach, you, you mentioned it. It's about how you take something like, if you add up six philosophers in a room, and so your number is six, that doesn't have the same relation to the parts uh, because a one would be an odd number, six is an even number. Or if you add three and three, those are two odd numbers, you get even. So there's, there is some separation in the idea of the unity of number mm -hmm. that, that you don't find in what I'll call traditional logic, especially inductive logic. Mm -hmm. And that separation is, I think, that Gadamer addresses all through his writings. And he addresses specifically here by saying that in a way that Plato is not really a metaphysical thinker. He's not like Heidegger being this, as he calls in one place, this youthful theological writings. That is like Aristotle after the one. Uh, and Plato will not do that, and Gadamer will not do that. I hope I'm making sense and following through in the previous comments. Mm -hmm. On mute. Okay. Uh, John Arthos. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, uh, but I, I think I even want to try to push it a bit further. Um, the um, b beyond even the, the the move that he makes away from math for geometry, um, and it has to do. Oh, so before I do that, though, David, could you read that sentence again? The Gadamer, the 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 sentence that you began uh, on beauty that Gadamer wrote in the earlier essay. Oh, I'll need a second to find it. No, go ahead. I I gotta look it up here. Okay, I didn't read it before. I just summarized it, but I'll find it in a second. Oh, okay. Uh, because that was a really helpful uh, statement. Um, but the point that I wanted to make is that I don't think uh, summative or even additive is works here. I mean, uh, so, uh, and I actually wrote a paper about this, but I've never sent it out because I, I realized that it wasn't right because I was really focusing on this idea of, of increase of being, which is so important, especially in Gadamer's aesthetic theory. Um, and, you know, this notion of um, uh, the, the um, inexhaustibility of the, of the meaning, uh, of the meaningfulness of the work of art, you can, you cannot use it up. Both Heidegger and, God, and, and Gadamer use that phrase, you can't use it up. Um, so this, I was working with this rhetorical concept of auxesis or increase or augmentation, right? As a, that's a sort of a, a Platinian idea, right? But then I realized that that Gadamer and Heidegger both pull back from that because they introduced the notion of withdrawal and the negative, which uh, complicates this idea of you know, rising to the universal and the increase of being and all of that. So I think it's more complicated than saying that 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 beauty or truth or anything is additive. Um, did you find that? Um, did you find yeah, that? David? I've got it here. It. Right. Um, he first by talking about the hippias major, and he says, the distinction made there between what is had in common by the members of a genus, 
and what is had in common by things counted as a sum. So that's the distinction between like a form as, as defined in a genus and then a collective as reflected as a sum. And then he shifts to talking about diatima and the ascent to beauty in the symposium. And he says, the beautiful is experienced again and again in each thing as something whose beauty is distinct and unique unto itself. It is experienced in the sum of all the stages of the ascent from bodies to souls. And then he talks about below, um, one senses the character of number and measure in the good and the beautiful. And this indeed implies that what is in common in the genus is not what is in common here. So the commonality relationship is not the relation between a defining principle among genus, but this idea of a, a sum. That's the most page, page, page number, David. David. Oh, well, this is, this is this book right here. Right. And Dialogue the page. And dialectics are okay. <laughs> page 133, 134. Thank you. Yeah, sure. He just refers to it at, you know, on page 264 of our text. He says, I would refer to my own presentation, which are first published in the Proceedings ID and Number in the series of the Heidelberg Academy under the title Plato's Unwritten Dialectic. So that's why I turned to it because he says, okay. So, yeah. That, yeah that thank thanks i mean it, it's tricky because you know Gadamer has genuine uh hermeneutic charity right he thinks along with and you can't always be certain when he is describing someone else's idea and his own or when he's describing someone else's idea as a way to move towards his own view it's not always clear in the text um but 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 so uh, what i'm saying is that i feel uncomfortable with attaching to godamer the idea of the beauty being summative or even additive or you know because i to me i think that there is something going on something heideggerian going on in his idea of beauty and truth that involves correction you know pulling back, you know, being corrected, you know, being open to the other, which is not. Um, so so I, I'm not I'm, I'm not yet comfortable saying that beauty is just uh, an increase of being. Okay, thanks. Greg. Yeah, it's, I, I had a question that was just prompted by, uh, I think it was the last thing that that Jim said toward the beginning. Um, and that it's just a question I'd, I'd like to hear other people's opinions on. Do you see Gadamer here with his, uh, his challenge to Heidegger's reading of Plato? Is he here just saying, yeah, look, this, this approach of destruction that you've got laid out, Heidegger, that's the right approach to take. You just didn't apply it properly here to Plato's case. Or is this intended to be more than that, that it's, if, you know, certainly not an outright rejection, but a subtle critique of the way Heidegger understands the project of destruction itself. Um, so is that, is, is the critique partly of destruction or is it just of how Heidegger went about doing it in this case? And I'm not sure which I would want to say on that. My view is that it's about Heidegger went about doing it because he's, he explicitly says Heidegger is not the way to read Aristotle. He says Heidegger's concerns were dominated by the impulse of his own questioning. He says this is no way, you know, he imported all these Christian ideas. He says this is in no way a model for interpreting Aristotle. Um, but it is a model for deliberate confrontation with tradition of philosophizing. So I think he appreciates what Gadamer found in Aristotle with ideas of aletheia and appreciates the ways in which it showed us a way out of scientific rationality. But then he thinks, in addition, that was already in Plato. And Heidegger was not a good enough reader of Plato to realize those ideas are already in the sophist, where sophist talks about difference being a positive being rather than just an absence of being. So that my view is yes to both. <laughs> yes, the deconstruction didn't go far enough, 
And yes, Heidegger didn't do it well enough because Heidegger was concerned with his own issues and so did not read Aristotle right or Plato right. But I think I'm an outlier on that. Jim, you've been waiting. I initially lowered my hand because Greg said I'd like to hear from others. <laughs> but because um, I think of Greg, that was a great question. And I'm not sure if I'm agreeing or disagreeing with, with David Vesey on this. Uh, Yes, the destruction means freeing up the concept. So it's a destruction of the history of metaphysics. Whether that destruction was a felicitous reading of Aristotle, um, Gadamer uh, uh, or, or Plato, Gadamer uh, says that Heidegger didn't give a felicitous reading. So what do we mean? But the, I thought you were also asking about whether Gadamer is carrying out in his own way a form of destruction. And I think that's true. Uh, that he does do that. Uh, that's why he had these constant, tried to have these constant conversations, real or indirect, with that he died. He thought, Gadamer thought he was carrying out his own form, a milder form of uh, destruction. Um, but I hope this is adding, my other comment, I hope it's adding to the, the, the direction of your question. Um, it's how Gadamer wants to see that there's a sense of Heidegger's aletheia, even in Plato. And that's what I think is really remarkable that I, I didn't see Gadamer saying so bluntly in some other places. Um, and I think that gets back to a question that was in the crowd. Uh, but I just remember my, my, my point why I initially raised my hand. It's to David Vesey. It's what play, why I said, that for Plato, the, you can't, the concept of the beautiful or the idea of the beautiful, the form of the beautiful is harder to talk about because as you know from the Phaedrus, um, Plato gives the, the beautiful special status among the ideas. He said, is it the one idea that is most lovely and most manifest? So he's linking the beautiful to the appearing. Mm -hmm. And so then you see in the, Philebus, where he says the, the power of the good takes refuge in the nature of the beautiful. So the beautiful complicates the whole idea of the forms and the appearance, I think, because he, he doesn't want, Gadamer wants to say following Plato in the Phaedrus, there's no doubling there with respect to the beautiful. I think I'd say that with respect to good too, with the idea that often when we experience something good, we learn something new about what it means for something to be good in that moment. So well, that the particular gives us some content rather than just pointing us away to the form that we've understood already. It is, I don't want to dominate. So this is the last one. And notice that in the Republic, the good is beyond being. Sure. Um, so it's not even a form as Gadamer points out. Uh, he never, discusses the good as a form. Um, so, you, mm -hmm. and I think Gadamer is very nuanced about how you can possibly, and I, uh, Frank Gonzalez does this as well. He talks very well about uh, how we can understand what, what Plato's talking about, but, oh, excuse me, now I'm rambling. In his other book on, Gadamer's other book on the Platonic Aristotelian idea of the good, you see this point made as well. Uh, that the good is not some um, ideal universal somewhere that people try to know. Anyway, that's, I don't want to get from where the conversation was going. Sorry. Greg, is your still hand up still from before or is it, or is it you want to continue with something? Yeah, John Gardner in there. It, it is still up from before, although I'll, I'll add just, just one thing on that, that I, that I think for Gadamer, it's not just the beautiful and the good, but every concept that is kind of like fleshed out anew. He, he says somewhere in Truth and Method that, you know, every time we use a word, that word comes to like share in the particularity of the circumstances that we're considering at the time. So it's, um, 
you know, regardless of what's the case for Plato, for Gadamer at least, I think every concept we use is kind of constantly being enriched and grown. Um, not that you were denying that, David, just to, to add that further yeah. on. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I'm guess John Garner to get in here. We haven't heard from you yet. Uh, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, this this meeting, and um, I got an invite um, from a friend. So, um, in, in any case, I just wanted to ask um, uh, this idea of the good not being an idos. Um, does this factor in? Is this a third, maybe a third point of his critique of Heidegger's reading of uh, of Plato? in that um, the link between ADOS and vision etymologically um, seems to direct Heidegger, and I'm looking at 262 here, he seems to be suggesting that that link between ADOS and vision directs Heidegger to read Plato uh, as a subjectivist of a sort. And um, th uh, he, let's see, um, I think there's a quote in here where, where he gives that impression anyway. Um, vision of the ideas. Um, uh, I, I won't look for the quote. I, that will just distract me. I'll get my question. The question is, uh, by indicating that the good is beyond even ADOS, uh, is this a way of trying to see Plato as not this uh, sort of subjectivist in terms of ideas um, and that he's not um, uh, anchoring uh, the the you know objectivity or something like that in in, uh, in in consciousness or something along those lines. Does anyone want to uh, answer that? I'd like to answer <laughs> Greg's question okay. first, if I could. No, no, John, just wait. Let's let's get this one that's on the table okay. right now. Um, the good beyond being doesn't come up very I think much. I'm seeing the, as I, uh, I think I'm seeing the sentence that it's at the bottom of 260, where he says, where Gadamer's writing, uh, thinking in the old Parmenides remains equally nestled in being, blah, blah, blah. Plato's turn to the idea signifies against this reorientation away from concerning the truth of being, which Heidegger saw at the time, uh, and toward the question concerning the correct way of seeing being. Is that... Is that the statement that you're looking at, John? Yes, you, you found the exact one I was looking for. I was on the wrong page. What page is it again, Eric? The bottom of one six, or 260. I see. Yeah, so Heidegger reads Plato as uh, developing a way of, of having a C being, um, bringing it to, to vision in a certain sense. But, but if we read Plato's ADOS mm -hmm. uh, as not applying as the good is not ADOS, is beyond ADOS or something like that, then, um, then in reality, we can gather Plato into a project that, that doesn't um, reduce um, the good or arguably I mean, the good, the highest idea to, um, to something that has to do with, with vision or something. Yes, I want to agree. I'm sorry for speaking out of turn. I want to confirm John Gardner's, Gardner's point. Um, yeah, I think he's spot on in that. And just to remind everyone that, you know, the, what is the, an English translation of Eidos, if I follow Joe Sachs on this, it's the intelligible look. So it still pertains to a scene, but I think John Garner, as you were saying it, I think you're right on your read, how Heidegger reads it to see it tied more directly to, to human seeing. I mean, the Greek does do privilege uh, vision. There's no doubt about that. Um, but then, so where does Gadamer locate the good? And it goes back to the mathematics and the whole idea of, of, of a ratio and a proportion and a fitting measure, which is not itself a calculative one. Right, John, John Gardner? <laughs> I'm concurring. Glad you're here, John. Jim. Okay, I'll shut good, up. Good to see you, Jim. So um, I mean, this is a, a, maybe a Plato question. I mean, you brought up the Republic and the way he talks about the good is beyond being in Republic is that like light, which enables vision to take place, the good enables a kind of intellectual scene, intuition can take place. 
And I take, I've always taken that to mean because it is in the excellence of a mind that this kind of scene can take place. And what it sees are things in their excellences, perfections, forms in their perfections. Um, and that's why the good is the, the medium through which this happens, because it's in the perfection of the mind and perfection of the object that they come to, come to be connected. But I understood, I've always understood the sophist and the discussion of, of collection division to be a very different model. And that is the idea, it's no longer a matter of sort of moving toward perfection and grasping things in the perfection, but now it's about grasping things in the differentiation. So Theotius flies, it's because we understand that flying is different from sitting and they're incompatible, that we come to recognize these differences, and that fishing is different from hunting in some ways. And so we're no longer grasping fishing as perfection, we're now grasping differences and differences are positive features of the forms and so I don't know how the talk about the good beyond being, I, I just, I mean, I think this is a, a view of play that Godwin doesn't hold, that there is a critique of the forms. There's a, the way the forms are presented in the Republic, there's a critique of that view in the Sophist and the Parmenides and the Statesman maybe. And I sort of hold that view too. So I'm not sure how to, how to square together the idea that the the good is beyond being and the account of forms you get in a republic and the way that makes sense to me in the public to the way that the forms are represented in the sophist and the focus is not any longer about perfection but about differences i don't know that's just a question i have maybe it's a question of plato scholarship more than a question of Gadamer, but it's part of a question too of how to understand the legacy of the phrase the good is beyond being and whether it applies anymore when we're talking about these later dialogues and it doesn't show up in this reading, really, right? It's just a passing comment. I think I think it's all the same question. Oh. Uh, what uh, we're asking here, first of all, why does Gadamer spend so much time talking about Heidegger, and how does that? What does that have to do with the Eidos, and what does that have to do with the uh, subjectivism, and uh, and getting around the idea of consciousness and subjectivism in Greek thought. And I, I agree with what you said, David, let's see about that. Um, Heidegger always, uh, or Gadamer has written 10 uh, essays on Heidegger and the Greeks. <laughs> now, why is he doing that? Because he wants to show us that the way that he's he's using, he's he found in Gadamer a way or in Heidegger, a way to go beyond Heidegger. And, mm -hmm. and um, for example, he's, he's trying to explain why, uh, you, you know, Heidegger, for example, saw the idols as the what, you know, a question to the what that, 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 that Aristotle split off from the that and so on. Uh, because uh, Heidegger is still trying to, you know, de sort of, you know, purify Greek thought uh, of of uh, as I say the the idea of the subjective, and and he he wasn't able to do that, but but he Heidegger made an amazing breakthrough in 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 language. Heidegger Gadamer starts ta talking about that uh, about the translation of the Greek and getting around the Latinization and so on, and going back to to normal dialogue and so on, and and Heidegger and Gadamer saying without that he couldn't have done. He couldn't have gone where he was going. Yeah. And really, and the point I, I'm trying to make about that meeting with Gautamer is that Gautamer was so amazingly, yeah. uh, unbelievably uh, tense when he opened that letter is because there's only one other person alive in the world today that he could disc that he respected more about Greek philosophy yeah. than, than Heidegger, even though Heidegger was not the philologist that Gautamer was, nor and the and the people that do Greek philosophy today are not they don't believe in philosophy at all. They say oh, philosophy is irrelevant. Uh, uh, you know who, who wants to debate what philosophy is? Then uh, anyway, so so there's there's my little rant. But, <laughs> Thanks, but, John. but but I think they're all it's all interrelated. I think. Okay, fair enough. Don Marshall, <laughs> I, I think you were pursuing something. About, uh, I, I think. What you were talking about, namely Diarisis, as it appears in the Sophist, is present uh, in this essay, uh, and 
uh, I'm thinking of 266, where he talks about uh, the Phaedrus and says that uh, Socrates leads the lover, leads <laughs> Phaedrus through a diairesis in order to let him see that what he previously was thinking about love, the speech, the Lysias that he heard, is in fact nothing at all. It isn't true or false. It's just nonsense. Uh, and that goes back you know, directly to the idea of the question of the IT is this flying. <laughs> you know, it isn't that it's true or false. It's nonsense because it tries to weave together ideas that cannot be compatible with each other. Okay. So he takes that, but at the bottom of the page, and I thought this was very significant and very much to your point, he leads that into, so what, it, what happens with Phaedrus? What happens with Phaedrus is that now he comes to see what love is, and that's an anamnesis, yeah? Uh, and that discussion of anamnesis then leads into the Mino, okay? So uh, I, I don't think that there's a, a, a conflict here. I think Gadamer is trying to connect uh, these things. The Eidos, he, he stresses over and over that the good is not an Eidos because in the Phaedo, when he talks about the Eidos, he says, when we see many things which we give the same name to, we postulate of the many one Eidos, their look or appearance. Uh, and so on 260, uh, he says, Plato's allegory of the cave, Heidegger interpreted this uh, Plato's doctrine as a step toward Aristotle. The idea is to be conceived from the standpoint of the one who is looking. That's subjectivity. And Gadamer says, no, that's not true. That would necessarily not be the being that shows itself and opens itself. Okay. But that is what is there in Plato. <laughs> he was, that is what is there in Plato not Heidegger's interpretation of him. So being, and he said this earlier on page 256, when he said he had Brentano's book on the senses of being in Aristotle and saw that being is not a genus. Okay, being is not a genus, which is a very, it, it's, there are many kinds. So the analogy is sunshine. We don't see light, we see things in the light. And that's what Socrates says, in the Parmenides when he's replying to, you know, he offers this, well, maybe it's like sunshine, okay? So it's all pervasive, but we don't see it. It's not something that is the object of our vision. It's not an ADOS, okay? It's not a genus, okay? Um, yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah, Greg. Yeah, this might just be a, a different way of putting maybe the same point that uh, John and Don made in their last couple comments. I, I was just going to ask why. So you you nicely kind of contrasted this view of forms uh, as realized in perfection versus forms as realized in differentiation. And I guess I didn't see why those certainly those are different from one another, but why they would have to be opposed to one another, because it seems to me that one might say, and this seems like a kind of plato -y thing to say that it's it's in the excellent instance of a thing or in the excellence of a thing precisely that its differentiation from other things is most evident right it's it's in the really good horse that you see what makes a horse different from you know a mule or or other kinds of critters on the farm whereas a not so good horse right the, those uh, those differences are less fully clear so could we read the, the later stuff talking about differentiation, not as an abandonment of the stuff about excellence or perfection, but just as like a further elaboration of it? So, yeah, I think you could. But I think what what's lost that you gain in the sophist. Well, first of all, there's a difference in the process by which we come to identify the form. And when you're talking about the perfection, then it seems you're moving farther and farther away from the exemplars. But with different process of collection and division, you're remaining within the way the exemplars show you the differences. But more importantly, for what Gadamer is saying, is that when you focus on forms as perfections, then um, their opposites seem to be just simply absences. 
So ugliness is the absence of beauty. Coldness is the absence of heat. Um, difference is the absence of sameness. And that's what he wants to say in isn't the case in the sophist. He wants to argue difference as a positive property rather than just the absence of sameness. And it is in by being always aware of difference, then difference becomes the ways in which Godmar is going to say in all awareness, there is um, concealing there. All forms are are now interconnected in a web of relationships where when you talk about perfection, the forms seem to have each of their own individual existence. So you get a different picture of forms or forms are all completely interconnected in relationships of sameness and difference in the sophist. I think Godmer wants that. I think he thinks that's what really helps him. So that would be, so you could do your model. Perfection helps you understand the differences, but I think that you end up then focusing on differences, just absence. When I think he wants to talk about dips, difference as having not being is a, is a form of being. And that's what allows him to say the sophist says things false false things, because that's always the problem with Parmenides is, how do you say anything false? Because you're always talking about something. Does that make sense? That would be my take. What? Yeah, Jim. Yes, thank you, David. Uh, that really is one of the essential points, I think, from this text. You stated it clearly. And I would only add then, and this is also Gadamer's hermeneutics. That is, the one can't be one with itself, and dialogue has to be understood in its ontological character on just how you were characterizing the relation of sameness and difference. And that's why Gadamer is fundamentally Platonic. And this is a fundamentally different dialogue, dialectic than a Hegelian dialectic that would wish to uh, overcome difference mm -hmm. but so i want you to pause on what you said everyone heard it i think david got <laughs> to one of the hearts of the very issue of this paper just one going back to i was going to comment on what you initially said david and other people uh, took up an extension of your remark when you were talking about the good beyond being i thought you were slightly mistaken you didn't understand the analogy the 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 good is analogous to the sun that is the source of light. So the good doesn't do any, the light does the mediating. It, it allows the connection between the seeing and the seen. And the good is the source of truth and being. That's the analogy that makes possible the connection between knowing and the known. So the good as source, now let me use the Greek word for source. It's an RK, uh, uh, but, and let me be Heideggerian. One always returns to a source. The source is different from a beginning, literally a starting point of a race. You could say the race starts, but the source of the race is something different from a beginning. And so uh, when Gadamer then recognizes, takes seriously that the good is the, source of truth and being. It's something that is not itself an object of being in that way. But it is not non-being either. It is, as Gadamer will say, I think, it's in the measure of something. When you find out what something properly is, a just society, a, a good Swiss army knife, uh, that proper measure of its being proper to what it is, is good. Yeah, no, I understand that. That's a good point. That's a, that's that's exactly right. It feels um. It feels theological to me, right? To put right, it's got, it feels like that's just feeding that medieval. Like, see where it goes, right? There is the source of that which is beyond all being, which is the source of all things, and is good. Um. But I think the last part. It's is not a Plotinian one. It's no. not that kind of a source. Right. Yeah, I understand that. But it is a good. It, it makes sense to call it the good rather than the indefinite or the logos or many other things that got credited for being the source. Actually, we shouldn't say a good. We should just say there is good. There is good. Es gibt gut. <laughs> es gut. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
Greg, are you up next? Are you so I think Eric's up next, right? I think there's leftover hands here. Is that okay, Eric? Greg, Eric hasn't got in in a while. I just never took mine down. Oh, come Sorry. on, Greg. <laughs> All right, so so this this is going to shift gears a little bit. It's still an analogous to what we're talking about, but I want to look at page uh, two fifty nine, where where Gadamer is saying almost right in the middle of the page, he's talking about, you know, we obviously immediately understood it from his relationship to Husserl, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then it may show with what kind of immaturity we followed him, but perhaps also how everything that came from Heidegger spoke to us, right? That, that we even trusted him that, that the Eleics were talking about patricide and we thought patricide was awesome, so provocative, right? That, that they're captivated by Heidegger's rhetoric, that they're willing to take his, his rhetoric as authoritative for what's actually in the text. And, and so I'm trying to see this as Gadamer talking about his own, and now because Jane, Jim, you brought up the difference between a source and a beginning, right? That, that uh, whether this is Gadamer's beginning or Gadamer's source of this kind of uh, inspiration towards philology to get the Greeks right in such a way to preserve the kind of heat of Heidegger without the kind of, and this goes back to the sophistry stuff, without the bullshit of Heidegger, um, where, where if Heidegger is saying that there is Patrick, right, the stranger from Elea pleads uh, that it would not be construed that he wished to commit patricide, right? And that Heidegger is talking about patricide and all this stuff uh, in such a way that Gadamer's saying, when we actually read it, we know that that's not true. That's not, that's not an accurate reading. So when he's arguing about the difference between the sophist and the philosopher, is this an indirect way of jabbing at Heidegger being a sophist with regard to his ability to read Plato, at least? And is that part of like Gadamer's existential beginning, uh, this, this, the way to the beginning? Jim, go I ahead. Brief. I will be brief. Uh, no, no. I would just say no because uh, uh, Gadamer had a has an immense had an immense respect for for Heidegger, and Heidegger broke a lot of new ground. And um, he he uh, uh, his thought eventually was so powerful. Heidegger's own thinking, and uh, he he got a shall we say over his skis perhaps. But and then Gadamer decided very early on that he that you cannot divorce philosophy from philology, and Gadamer was a better philologist than 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 Heidegger. But I don't I don't think that that uh, that uh, I mean sophistry is really it's really bullshit. That's what like Henry Frankfurt decides what or describes very, very clearly what, what's being said at the end of the sophist, about the sophist, if you know what I mean. So that's that's my view, okay, so. Um, yeah, I think you're half right, Eric. I think it is, it is something about Godmer's beginning. Uh, I, that's why, again, I think this essay is very important. Um, but no, I think that I'd rather say of Heidegger that despite his brilliance, um, he, had, he had a blind spot. And you could say, as he says, every thinker thinks one, one thought, one great thought. When Heidegger imposed his question, whereas Gadamer really is, as we, those of us here that have studied Gadamer know this, he lets the question also rebound in a way that it has to be really the text of, of uh, it's the question from the side of the other. And all that great, uh, that mind of Heidegger 
to be so creative in his thinking, the way he was to change if the, the nature of philosophy in some sense. He had a blind spot because his question so directed him to force an interpretation, I think. Um, yeah. Great. Eric, does that answer your question? Yeah, it addresses it. Yeah, yeah, yeah for Good. sure. And John, too. Yeah. Good. All right, Don Marshall. Well, I'm going to have to chew over Nathan's question a little more. I don't quite want to answer that. It's sort of about the psychodynamics of Gadamer and Heidegger. Uh, and uh, I'm mindful of John's that, that Gadamer himself continually returned to this question of his relation to Heidegger and Heidegger's relation to the Greeks, which were connected issues for him. And he comes back to it again and again. It's not something where he wants to defeat uh, Heidegger, but he's constant, but he also is not submitting, he's not subordinating himself to Heidegger. So it's a very complex relationship. Okay. But I wanted to go back to, I thought, Jim's point, because, and just to cite a specific place here on, on 266, that seemed to me the joint uh, between where Gadamer is talking about Heidegger and this question of the being that is and the being that is not the being that is nothing, what he actually quotes from the sophist, the ados of not being, of not this, which is an astonishing phrase to me. I mean, it just sort of blew my mind that there's an ados of not being, you know, really? What? Okay. But at that point, he then takes up the next topic as the dialogues are, in a sense, this distinction in practice. Uh, so that the, the two issues are connected. The issue of the sort of ontology of the this and the not this, not uh, difference, not as just different, but as the positive existence of the not being, okay, which leads to the intertwining of appearance and concealment, uh, those kinds of things. And that the dialogues are, are enacting this same process. Uh, and that's that I think is a very important joint in, and, and that means dialogue is essential to platonic dialectics in the way that predicative statements are essential to Aristotelian metaphysics. Yeah, to put it too simply. Okay. Wow. So then I wonder what to make of the talk about the I never I never put in writing what I really think. You know, all that, I mean, if the dialogue for form is essential to what it means to be thinking platonically, then it seems like the dialogues are where it happens or something like this, right? But mm. David Weberman. David Weberman and me. Yeah. Yeah, hi, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Uh, so I'm very interested in this idea. Um, um, I had a hard time actually understanding uh, Gadamer's essay. And, <clears throat> but I'm very interested in this idea about difference and sameness and the difference between Gadamer and Heidegger on this, and in particular, this view of Gadamer's and how it relates to say being in, in uh, Truth and Method, where he doesn't have that much to say about platonic forms, you know, at least in the, first two thirds of the book. Um, so I'm wondering um, whether the view David Bessie put out about sameness and difference, whether this uh, is reflected, how it's reflected exactly in his hermeneutics. Uh, for example, when Gadamer says that the object uh, is a kind of phantom and doesn't exist apart from um, being constituted by interpreters. Is, is, is that related to this idea of um, Gadamer's different take on the sort of non-self-containedness of things? Um, so I'd, I'd like to hear more about that particular view, not so much in, in in terms of what's a good interpretation of Plato or, and not necessarily, although I'm more interested in how this differs from Heidegger, 
but just in um, how that particular view is reflected in Gadamer's hermeneutics, where he's not, uh, especially when he doesn't talk about the forms in Plato. Is that is that clear what I'm asking about? I just like to hear more about this view. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to talk about that, Greg. Yeah, I mean, I th I think the the clearest place we find that in Truth and Method, at least, is in this discussion of uh, the logic of question and answer and how. To understand a statement, you always have to understand the question to which that statement is an answer. And then in turn, to understand the question, you need to understand the whole horizon of possible answers that that question calls forth. And, and the point he's getting to with that is that it's in the nature of meaning itself that anytime I say this thing is like this, there's at least an implicit and not that. Um, any anytime I say something, I am affirming one answer out of a horizon of, of multiple answers and thereby kind of rejecting the others. So, so the determinacy of a statement or, or an assertion, what he'll call it, uh, an Aussage is, is his term, is always determined by whether it's explicit or implicit, the other ways of presenting the thing that that rejects. Um, and so I take it that's kind of the clearest place that that, that comes out in the text. And I would say too, with the idea that there's always more to be said, that with every, with every clarification, there's always a recognition that it connects to other things. Maybe it's a phenomenological idea that there's always, there's always more perspectives, there's always other sides, there's always different horizons that will tell us more. And so by recognizing that every statement is a differentiation. It's also recognizing that there are different ways of saying it and with new ways of saying it, new insights that will arise. I think that's part, of, yeah. Because, uh, because it, there seems like there might be a difference here. I mean, the way you were putting the point, David, before, uh, it sounded uh, somewhat Deleuzian. Uh, mm -hmm. So right. it's about radical heterogeneity. And radical heterogeneity might still allow for a kind of self-sameness of everything that's different. Uh, everything's different from everything else, but everything is kind of, in some sense, self-same. Uh, whereas in Ga Gadamer's hermeneutics, I think is, is sort of cha challenging the very notion of self-sameness. And so, um, but maybe I misunderstood you before, so is it about radical heterogeneity? Is it about non-self-sameness? Or in fact, are those two things uh, convergent or? <laughs> I, I didn't, I wasn't thinking I was presenting it as radical heterogeneity. I thought I was, I was presenting it that any, any identification is also a differentiation. And the differentiation isn't just simply a empty negation but a pause. So anytime you say you're sitting, you're also saying, and that means you are not flying. And that means you are not walking rather than just, there's also lots of things, you, an empty negation field around that. that uh, and that to understand the concept is to understand what is ruled out by sitting in the ways that some things aren't ruled out by sitting. Good. That helps. And I did kind of misunderstand you before, but that's very helpful. Thanks. Okay. It's very interesting. I, I think there are others who, had, who are ready to help too. Jim, did you want to say something on this as well? Uh, yes. After your last comment, I, I, I would say to David Weberman that uh, there is something like a non-self-sameness in, in Gadamer's hermeneutics. And what you were, David Vesey, what you were saying, I think is accurate, but I like to say, to speak for Gadamer, who has such an indebtedness to Plato, Whenever we talk about anything, one idea is always together with another idea. And so that's the character of sameness and difference that is there. So there's never a self-sameness that is overlooking the heterogeneity of things. Uh, there's never sheer difference, but there's never sheer identity either. 
one idea is always there with another idea whenever we speak. And so it doesn't have to, I, I said idea, but uh, it doesn't, when I use, the, when I start, if we start saying concepts, uh, that takes it to a level, uh, notice how important it is for Gadamer to talk about the relation between concepts and words. So we're not really dealing with concepts. We are and we are not in a way. In a hermeneutic conversation, we're not really dealing with a concept, we're dealing with a matter at issue and our discourse about it, we're always in the presence of one thing in relation to another. Yeah, great. Uh, John Beach, you had your hand up earlier to it, oh. wanting to, to respond to David Weberman. Do you still have something to say on that, John? Or maybe you need Thank to you. unmute. Yeah. Okay. Great question, David Berman. And um, uh, uh, like Gadamer says, there's no text that has a meaning in itself. I think that's, there's no object in itself as a meaning. I think you're referring to that as well, I, I assume. And I would, my response to that is by giving uh, you uh, an answer to everybody here, that'll be a bit surprising, but Gadamer does say somewhere that Heidegger's interpretation of Plato is correct if you grant him uh, time as the as the basis for being and existence, the temporal concept of of of, of design, it it it's actually cogent and and coherent. So, uh, what I'm trying to say is that for Gadamer, there's always the presuppositions. There's always the four uh, knowledge and so on. There's always you 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 always start within philosophy. It's like you know, Fusus in, in Aristotle, it's, it's always within Fusus, never leaves it. It's from Fusus to Fusus, like it's, and, and that's why there's no, um, there's no objective, there's no fill, like what the contemporary classicists are looking for, it doesn't exist, you know, they're never going to find it. That's my, I hope that's, I hope that answers your, <laughs> your question. I don't know. Yep, good. William, you keep jumping in and out here. Do you want to? Did you want to get in and take us in a new direction? There he is. That's why you're jumping in and out. No, that's David. William, are you there? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. There you are. Am, am I? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. They, I think my, what I was going to say was sort of answered already, but it's just a reminder that the um, like the, it's the one and the many. So it's not pure difference. It's about the fluid interrelation uh, between the one and the many. Um, and, and also just on 264, um, he's talking about the network of ideas. So it's not an idea, um, like uh, isolated ideas. It's, it's all about interconnection. So it, it, I, I think it, uh, but the main point I was trying to get is that there's an aspect of the one as well, but I think that had been brought up already. Good, thanks. Yeah, John Arthos. Yeah, I wanted to keep on with this question that David asked, um, the so in the text, I mean, I think really that's what the topic of the last third of the paper is about, because he starts he 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 introduces this is theme of the idea or the form, um, and then uh, he talks about it in relationship uh, as you uh, uh, um, as as you just said, William, to the the one and the many, the theme of the one and the many. So those two are connected, but then he also connects it to this idea of the universal and the particular. So all, those are all related themes. Um, and so that's what sent, because I also didn't think um, that, I, I think he gives us hints, but he doesn't really tell us here um, how this, how he's answering this question. So I went back to truth and method and I looked at, at the, at at the many places that he talks about the relationship of the universal and the particular and you know it's throughout it's, it's in so many areas and as 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 um as as jim mentioned it relates to methexis and everything else it's just so pervasive but the places where he's explicitly talking about it i found that there were three basic sort of uh dynamics in play or, or themes in play. One was that the idea of reciprocity, right? So there's a relationship between the, the one and the many or the universal and the particular, a reciprocal relationship, right? So, or, or the relationship of the part to the whole. So that's very hermeneutic and that's hermeneutic all the way back, 
you know, to Augustine. And then uh, the other, the second uh, thing that he does when he talks about this relationship is that um, that the that there that human beings, you know, there isn't a, a, a there isn't a beginning in our understanding of of the universal or of the idea, uh, but we have a sense of direction, uh, uh, you know, in relationship to to the one, right? In other words, there aren't all these random contingent particularities with no relationship at all. Um, we always have a sense of how they might relate to something more unified. Um, so that was the second thing. And then the third thing I found was that he talks about this relationship as schematic in the Kantian sense. It's interesting in this article, he talks a lot about Hegel, but he doesn't talk about Kant. Um, but but I think that that's inherent to Gadamer's hermeneutic sense of the relationship of the one to the many, that there's this sort of, we have initially, and this is Heidegger too, you know, with the formal indication, we have some kind of a, uh, a schematic sense, uh, a sketch, uh, a rough sense of the whole. And we sort of, his, in history, in time, we're sort of gradually getting a clearer sense, we're moving towards a clearer sense, we're sort of filling it in as we go. Um, so, and those three things kind of related, um, relate to each other to me in terms of my sense of what his answer would be if I was gonna try to summarize it. Um, and so then that, and this is why it, it's peculiar to me that he doesn't men mention Kant in this context, right? Because it was Kant who was trying to understand that in terms of the way human beings judge, right? Um, through the imagination rather than through, through reason. Um, um, and so, um, so yeah, so that's, that's my long-winded answer to what I came up with anyway about how Gautamer thinks about the relationship of the universal uh, to the particular. Okay, thanks, John. William, you're coming back in here? Yeah, I was just gonna follow up on John's point. Like I was a little surprised in this paper, he doesn't talk a lot about methexis um, because and how that could relate to the uh, universal in particular. And I was gonna say um, elsewhere, uh, for example, in Plato as portraitist, he talks uh, quite a bit about that. And, and I think that's an important conception to help that informs his hermeneutics. Uh, so you have the participation that relates to uh, the ideas of each other and also uh, particulars and universals. Uh, William, do you think Gadamer has, uh, I mean, what do you, how, how do you understand the relation between what Gadamer uses methexics and Plato uses participation? I, I mean, I, I would tend to think that they're they're quite aligned, um, but but he's writing about it um, regarding like his his discussions of Plato. But I I think he's probably talking about his hermeneutics as well, um, and that's again where I was a little surprised not to see it because uh, I thought it could deal well uh, in in this paper. Mm -hmm. But I'd be really interested in uh, like uh, some other people's points of view on on that point. But I, I would take it as a fairly fundamental point that you could apply to his uh, hermeneutics. I wondered whether it was implicit in what what Gadamer calls Heidegger's concern about Plato. That is, Heidegger likes Aristotle because he's working from facticity, mm -hmm. focused on rhetoric and ethics, focused on the particular, focused on phenomenologically, sort of articulating the lived experience and getting back to the life world, and and the focus on you know this facticity and this particularity. And then it seems like in Heidegger's version of Gadamer's and Gadamer's versions of Heidegger's concerns about Plato. Oh. Plato is too lost track of participation and oh. is focused too much on the intellectual and lost track of the ways in which fact all of these realizations have to come out of the factical hermeneutic situation, shall we say, concrete situation. And so Plato didn't adequate, lots of people think this, didn't adequately solve the question of what do we mean by participation. Mm -hmm. And as a result, he missed the concrete, the relevance of the concrete experience for understanding forms. So that's an elaborate way of saying, I wondered if it was, if talk about 
participation in the failure and talk about participation was latent in the way Gadamer presents Heidegger's concern about Plato. But Jim mentioned participation earlier and metaxics earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose it does connect to what he says about number, because number is a very specific way in which universals and particulars participate and interconnect. Jim, you want to come back yeah. in? Yeah. Just very quickly then, because I know John has his hand up. Remember, I, I think Gadamer is right that Plato simply doesn't make thematic, believe it or not, the issue of participation. He doesn't treat it as a philosophical topic, but you, but he would want, Plato would want to say this, and this is why you get this, Gadamer, Gadamer wants to say Plato is closer about this dealing with particulars than we think. That's why Gadamer doesn't want to call Plato the metaphysician. Is when you experience a, a beautiful painting, let's say, there is the beautiful in it. Mm -hmm. And what is not clear is it's not the Aristotelian where the essence is in the particular uh, and that as Aristotle so clearly works that out in the metaphysics uh, and the physics. So Plato doesn't want to say that uh, Reality is there, whole and part, in the thinghood of the thing. But he does want to say that the appearance is not merely a semblance of the form, that the form is there in the appearance. And he almost takes it as obvious, so that when I say the, the beautiful painting is beautiful, the, the sunset is beautiful, and he's asking what allows me to predicate beautiful itself of these different what is the beautiful itself about which is not to ignore the appearance yeah. it's yeah. to say this is the difference between sophistry and philosophy that the philosopher knows that the world is always doubled between mm -hmm. the appearances and the things of which they're uh, and that of which they are the appearances of yeah and we get that from phenomenology, right? The identity. And that's solution. phenomenology. Right. Yeah, exactly. Can make, <laughs> make it clear how that happens. Yeah. Yeah, I see that. Okay. Uh, can I say one other oh, thing? Yeah. And that's why yeah. you'd see a little bit less of this why Gadamer can't be a content. But to this is, goes back to John Arthos's question. But I would say that what Gadamer missed to, to be in line with John here, why he should not, why he could have mentioned Kant is he should have said something more, Gadamer should say more about the, the sense of the reflective judgment in Kant, because that's, if you will, the need of the universal without an imposition of the universality that you get from uh, a statement of knowledge. So. Got it, yeah, thanks. Okay. Did you say me? Yeah, I muted myself <laughs> and then and then called on you. <laughs> Go ahead, John. Uh, v, jump in here. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, by the way, I'm just I'm so excited. I, I I'm probably not talking very clearly, but I love this discussion. But I just wanted to say that that the uh, to John Arthos to add is that you know there's this this great example in the last part of the posterior analytics of Aristotle that Gadamer refers to several times and when he'd refer to it in lectures, he'd have a big smile on his face, you know, of the army in retreat, right? And then one guy stops and then blah, blah, blah. So I think like, of course, that's the, um, that's that's what Aristotle, Gadamer's trying to say, well, that's what Aristotle really thinks, all this stuff about propositions and all this stuff. He doesn't do that in his philosophy at all. That's just, you know, that's just theoretical stuff about, uh, but, but this is how it really happened. And I think, I think Gadamer would say that, uh, that Aristotle's really got something right that Plato didn't quite see or didn't, didn't elucidate, you know, that, that, and I think Gadamer likes that, you know, that applies to Gadamer's truth and method as well. And then the one thing I'd say about the sophist and I did take a course with Gadamer, Heidegger on the Gadamer on the Sophist, and wrote a paper on it and so on. But the what Gadamer says about the Sophist is is kind of unique. At the end, he says that the Sophist really, it's not whether he's true or whether he's false or whether he overlooks this or whether he's he's lying or anything. Nothing like this occurs. Like a sort of Don Marshall was referring to, it's not really a lie or anything. 
it's like Trump, like, is he lying or what? You know, but it's, it's just, the Sophist presents himself as someone who knows, and he really knows he doesn't know, but he's really good at, at doing that. And I think that's an interesting uh, point about the Sophist, just to, to add that point. Okay. Great, great, thanks. Eric. Yeah, I'm connected to this, but also with what's been said in the last couple contributions, I wanted to look at page, um, sorry, uh, 263, where Gadamer first says, you know, now I maintain that this also constitutes the proper essence of our experience with language, that while thinking we see through all what is said, and similarly in conversing with one another, we contemplate something that is not in the words and not in the models and illustrations of the putative facts, that there's this what the the reality versus the appearance so we have the appearing is the language and then the the being is the reality uh this is just riffing off of what um the last couple folks were saying here this this kind of tension between uh the sophist and the dialectician or the the appearing versus the reality with the one and the many um that 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 somehow language is disappearing behind what is said in it is somehow illustrative for Gadamer about what participation really is. Okay, that's interesting. Don. Well, it, it seemed to me that uh where we were getting, especially with the James's remark and some others uh, lately, Gadamer isn't sort of championing Plato against Aristotle. <laughs> okay, uh, and I think it would be a mistake to think uh, that he is. It's not quite quite how he's uh, speaking. So on two sixty seven, uh, he says in the middle of the page, what I mean is that the platonic model should give us a glimpse at how we can arrive at a distinct articulated thought that maintains the legacy of metaphysics. So that, had, that sounds like Aristotle, and we should continue with that insofar as it is fruitful for us, okay? Uh, and on 260, uh, 269, uh, he is saying uh, at, at the bottom, okay, uh, this does not mean that we can calculate anything and everything. We have to find our way in our experience of the world. We have to find there's something about the experience of order that results from mathematical thinking that enables us to find our way in the world. And we, we should calculate anything where we can, but it doesn't, it means that uh, we can't always calculate everything. <laughs> There are other things. And so at the very end, in a, to me, a, astonishing, so kind of surprising move at the end that I hadn't expected. Uh, we still, he says on 269, we are not renouncing the will to know. Uh, in the scientific sense or in the metaphysical sense, we're not renouncing the will to know. But there remains a task of thinking, and that is that we have to think through not only the method of science and research, but also the beautiful and the divine. You know, he actually uses the words, the, we have the experience of beauty, the experience of God, religion, the experience of wisdom, uh, and that we need to include these. <laughs> okay. uh, so he's not, he's not abandoning Aristotle. He's just saying that's only part of the story. And the rest of the story takes us in a direction that I, I was astonished. I don't think of Gadamer as stressing the religious. And all of a sudden, here it is. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Puts that in the category of things that escape scientific rationality that we need to remain open to without dismissing science, right? William. Um, yeah, just I was interested in following up uh, from a number of the sp uh, speakers' uh, points, but I'll, I'll just start with Don's here. Like, it seems to me he, he's not really dismissing metaphysics at the end. He, he's just 
uh, trying to bring out uh, part of it that's st still relevant, and he's bringing in the religious and the divine. Um, um, he, he seems to, like throughout the paper, uh, mathematics plays quite a prominent role. Like he, he's connecting at the end there, mathematics to experiences of order. Um, earlier in the paper with, when Nathan was talking about language, he's connecting language with the experience of mathematics as well, which I think is quite um, striking and kind of reconciliatory. Um, he has a very unified um, approach seemingly at the end involving like mathematics, religion, the divine. Um, so yeah, I just thought it was, um, he, he's really bringing out sort of metaphysical or, or religious resonances at the very least at the end quite uh, strongly, which I would take as a statement of his own hermeneutics, not just of Plato. And I guess the question is, is uh, like he obviously doesn't want to go back to metaphysics in its uh, full full form, but it's it's what what aspects of it is he trying to retrieve? Because he, he seems to not be dismissive of it here. Yeah. So I want to speak to that. Yes, Jim. Um. Yes. I I don't think he wants to return to metaphysics if we understand metaphysics as he does as a certain giving priority to the concept. Um, but he wants to turn to issues that lie, and this is, I think Don's right. He says, I didn't, God, we're talking about maybe the importance of religion and, and so on. Yeah, he wants to talk about the experiences of knowing that are beyond, to use a Heideggerian language, the calculative. And that's language even Gadamer would use. And it's interesting, I think, Don, you brought us to the right place there to, as time is nearing too, to the very end. And I refer back to my opening comment about the essay. And when he gets to this point, when he says, aren't we missing something? Isn't thinking, uh, isn't there a task of thinking uh, beyond this calculative and scientific? Uh, and what is his answer to that? And that's when he introduces this idea of the immemorial. And he actually refers that back into Plato and the Phaedrus. And, and what's different with Phaedrus compared to Lysias in the speeches about love, and actually in Socrates' own difference between the first speech and the second speech, is that love is not simply a human madness. It's a divine madness. And what he means by divine in this sense is something that would overcome one. It's not a matter of human proposing or, or simply my desire for you, but uh, that which overcomes me. And, and that overcoming is also the start of hermeneutics. One is caught up by a text. One, a question comes to one. And so I'm already in to use a slightly different language that Gautamer still uses, in the middle of things. And that's, but that middle of things is because something has always already occurred. Something has happened before me. Uh, and all my knowing takes, is out of that experience or encounter. Um, so uh, it is interesting. He ends with that we are simply moved by the divine. Yes, I think it's a remarkable statement. And I'm wondering if that's more a reference to what's going on in the Phaedrus, uh, since he referenced the Phaedrus in the paper. John Arthos. Yeah, so I, so I think for me, the challenge is to try to understand what, you know, how we're in the middle, right? And, um, and, and so what's interesting to me is that Gadamer never dismisses the pure concept or the universal. They're virtual for him, but the, he, there's always this, you know, dialectic, right, between um, the concept and the word, uh, the universal and the particular. Um, and so uh, I ran down uh, where, so remember the Kant, when, when he talks about the the transcendental ske uh, schema as a, as a procedure of understanding that he says is an art concealed in the in the depths of the of the human soul. And I found a passage in the critique of judgment, which sounds so Gautamerian. 
and I wanted to read it to you. It says, this is much later. This is not in the schema chapter. He says, such is the nature of the ideal of reason, which must always rest on determinate concepts and serve as a rule and archetype alike in our actions and in our critical judgments. The products of the imagination are of an entirely different nature. Uh, no one can explain or give an intelligible concept of them. Each is a kind of monogram, a mere set of particular qualities determined by an assignable rule and forming rather a blurred sketch drawn from diverse experiences than a determinate image, an incommunicable shadowy image, uh, shot bill, such as painters carry in their heads of their creations. And that's the distinction between the aesthetic idea or ideal, is that correct? And the and a schema, and a schema, is that the distinction he's making there? Uh, it's the difference between uh, the 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 rational uh, the the rational logic of the concept, right? Reason, and uh, the method of, um, of 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 understanding that applies to the imagination, schematic thinking. Okay, thanks, John. We are nearing the end. Are there other things that you were hoping that we got to that we haven't? They thought, well, this would just be disappointing. I can't believe we never talked about what went on near the beginning when he talked about Kierkegaard or something like this. There are plenty of other things in here, right? That yeah, I've got, I've got something where... <laughs> yeah, <Eric>, good. <laughs> yeah, where uh, in the middle of 268, toward, well, a little lower than the middle, uh he he it's this paragraph that starts with as heidegger saw that the platonic story aristotelian answer blah blah blah. you go to the middle of that paragraph he says we know of higher cultures that did not go the way of the greeks toward mathematical proof and logic and the subsequent way toward philosophy metaphysics and modern science these other cultures did not distinguish between philosophy and religion between poetry and science as we have what other cultures is he thinking of? Is he talking about Confucians? Is he talking about, right? Like given that I'm interested in uh, discussions in philosophy of religion and religious studies, like the worry about Orientalism, like to what degree is Gadamer Orientalist here in that he's saying like, you know, in Japan, they didn't distinguish between philosophy and religion. For them, religion and philosophy are the same thing, just like the, just like an African traditional thinking. That's not philosophy. That's just religion, stuff like that. Um, because what I hear him saying, though, is that it's a problem that we've run into this radical separation of philosophy and religion. And what's nice about Plato is that he doesn't make it as extreme of a separation of these things. I think that's right. I think he's thinking about non-Western traditions, Orientalism is at work here, and romanticizing them is not making the same mistakes that we did. But science isn't a bad thing. Look what we've look what we've <laughs> accomplished. We just give it gave it too much too much power. Don, um, did you, what, Don, was there, oh, John Beach, John Beach, was there something that you want to make sure we, we touched on? Well, 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 I would just, I just wanted to respond uh, to, 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 to Eric's point, and it's, it's a hard, it's a tough one. Um, of course, Gadamer does think that it's good that we study these other um, cultures and so on, but at the same time, um, I have the feeling that he thinks that we are the only culture uh, like and and as as Eric said, th th this this separation wasn't made in in uh, Plato or in in early Greek thought the way Heidegger thinks it was. And Gadamer doesn't think we need a second beginning, a new beginning. And in a sense, I think that Gadamer would say that we are the only ones who could fix it because we are the only ones that can go back to our roots where the where 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 this sort of 
uh, technological drive uh, uh, frenzy originated. And, uh, but, but it's, it's, uh, that's, that's the way I view it. But, but nevertheless, he does advocate, Gadamer does, d does advocate and, and as, as, um, oh, what, um, Ted George wrote an article about that too, that, you know, of studying these other cultures and, and, and what Eric is doing. That's all I was going to say. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Don Marshall. Well, you know, last, just last comment. I, I, I that's I, I'm sorry. That's <laughs> terrible. But uh, we should go back and we should fix it because we're killing the world, as he says over and over again. We're destroying the world and everybody in it, thanks to the very science that we're so proud of. You know, so we do need to fix it. I don't think Goddard will ever talk about Chinese philosophy or whatever we want to call it, you know, Confucius, Lao Tzu, uh, Chuan Tzu. Uh, he will not talk about Indian Buddhism or Hinduism because he doesn't know the languages. And he will not talk about something where he can't read things in the original. Okay, And just, I, I, Nathan wasn't saying, and I'm not accusing him of it, but just to say, because our tradition separated philosophy from religion or as we say logos from mythos very problematic okay that doesn't mean there are logos and <laughs> uh you know it doesn't mean there is religion and and just we may we saw the distinction and they failed to see it okay we manufactured the distinction so it isn't that these are confused that isn't the japanese confuse religion with philosophy or something like that they think in a different way <laughs> okay they're thinking about these things in a different way where a distinct the need to make a distinction between philosophy and religion doesn't come up okay so okay yeah no that's great and in some ways that brings us back to the beginning of the essay where Gadamer talks about the possibility of maintaining the life of humanity is at stake yeah. in recognizing the limits of scientific thinking. Yeah. yeah. There we go. All right. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks for, for joining us. That was a tough one. Great. <laughs> we, we Great did, discussion. We did it very justice, helpful. though. I think I appreciate the suggestion. I'll uh, We'll meet again in late August. I just looked at the schedule, and it's the day before my classes start, which is sort of terrifying <laughs> to think about returning to the classroom but yeah so it'll be, it'll be a sunday late sunday in august and i'll send around the list if you have things requests of things to read next please send them to me and i'll put them on a reading list and we'll get a vote out and and move on to our next topic so, thanks everybody and don't forget about nasp this fall <laughs> send in your bye. papers send in your abstracts bye-bye bye-bye